Okay, for people joining this live stream, uh, this is kind of a working session that is a mixture of um, a physics project and uh, other things. So we're going to be talking about solving uh, partial differential equations, specifically the Einstein equations and how that relates to solving other kinds of equations and a bunch of exciting new things. And I thought maybe Jonathan could start off by presenting a paper he recently put out into the world about uh, solving the Einstein equations using our models. So uh, sure. do other people hear a repeated echo? I'm not no. hearing that. Yeah, oh, either. I figured it out. OK, sorry. OK, All right, OK. Jonathan, do you want to show yeah, sure. Hang on. Just give me one second. Um, close that down. Okay, right. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, perfect. Right. So uh, I think we discussed this in the last working session meeting. So I won't I won't talk about the physics too much. Let me just focus on the numerical aspects. So, so this is a, a method we um, developed for the purpose of solving the Einstein equations in the context of the physics project, but which we subsequently realized is actually a more general method than that. It, 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 it seems to be able to work for kind of any uh, arbitrary system of hyperbolic PDEs and possibly with some modifications for parabolic and elliptic ones as well. And I might talk about that later on. Um, but so the basic idea is you, uh, okay, so, so we, we're dealing with, with hypergraphs that look like this, right? So, so we, we, we have some, some object with connectivity information and we're treating this object like the sort of as though it's specifying the connectivity of a bunch of um, cells or, or, or you know gr grid cells in say a finite volume mesh. So the idea is each vertex in this in this hypergraph is like an individual grid cell in, in a finite volume mesh. And then uh, so it, it comes associated with a bunch of values. So in the case of the Einstein field equations, it comes equipped with information about the extrinsic curvature tensor and, and, and things like that. Um, and then at each time step, we solve the we solve those PDEs, the, the Einstein field equations, according to um, essentially a, a, an ordinary finite difference, you know, runge cutter style finite difference method. Um, and then we refine the hypergraph topology based on the values of those vector quantities, but you know, based on sort of projections of the conformal curvature tensor and things like that. Can so, I ask a question? Yes, so, please go. So when you speak about um, runge cutter. Um, method for solving a, uh, I mean, the Ranga Kata method is for time integration. And I'm, I'm a bit confused here now how that solves the spatial part of the problem. Right, right. No, no, that, that's a good point. So, so in effect, what we're doing is, uh, um, okay, so there's a, an ordinary kind of finite volume numerical scheme that's, that's sort of underneath all of this. Uh, so, so we're using a sort of a, a, a high order ADA type scheme for, for you know, solving the underlying, for, you know, for doing the spatial discretization. Uh, but then that, in order to achieve high order uh, time evolution, that requires effectively a, you know, a, a higher order predictor method for which we use Runge cutter as the, as, the, as the time discretization. Okay, so, so time is done with Runge cutter style method and there's a spatial discretization besides that. Okay, good. Right, exactly. Let me, let me just to, to clarify something. I want to just set down the architecture that Jonathan is using here. I mean, so at first, what he's doing is he's taking a hypergraph as the mesh and then solving for a field on that mesh. Then later right. on, he's going to throw away the, uh, but, but he's predefining the mesh and then adapting it. Later on, he's going to actually use the mesh as a piece of the dynamics. Right. and get the dynamics from the mesh, right? So at the first step, it's kind of something looks somewhat traditional, as in you've got a mesh and you're solving. But it sounded like he was using, uh, you know, uh, finite differences. It sounded like an actual spatial discretization. Yes, it, 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 in the first instance, it is. So, um, okay, so, so j just to elaborate on the point Stephen was making, let, let, me, let me just quickly run through roughly how that works. So, so, so we're doing, so all of this so far is a, is a completely sort of conventional numerical PDE method, just it happens to be on a slightly more unstructured, you know, um, people often do finite element, write finite element codes for totally unstructured meshes. They don't normally write finite difference or finite volume codes for unstructured meshes, but this is, a, uh, th th this is an example where we are dealing with a totally unstructured mesh. Um, and so our, our mesh refinement, you know, if, if we want to take, 
if, if we compute the, the, you know, some scalar parameter like this projection of the conformal curvature tensor exceeds some cutoff value at some, at some uh, node in, in the hypergraph, then we refine that node by just replacing it with a collection of nodes, you know, so, so some finite subgraph that preserves the connectivity information. And in fact, we can do that in an even, in an even finer scale. We can refine on, along an individual hyper edge if we want to. So we could-, we could So refine. you have something you adapt on, some, exactly, exactly. some measure. Yeah, some, some you adapt on. at the beginning, it's based on the field values, which are attached to the nodes here. Later on, what's going to happen is, at least for the Einstein equations, they're going to stop being field values associated with nodes, and it's just going to be the actual structure of the nodes themselves that define the field values. Right, right. Okay, but but for the in the in the first instance, if you want to think about the totally simplified version without any consideration of Einstein equations or whatever, uh, you can just think of every vertex is associated with some scalar parameter. And then there's a, you know, there are rules for how that scalar parameter changes from one time step to the next. And if that scalar parameter exceeds some value, then we refine that vertex or we refine the edge if the, you know, if the average for, for, the, for a particular edge exceeds some value. And we coarsen if it goes below a certain value. So at every point, the, the topology of the hypergraph is tracking the value of the scalar parameter. Hmm. Um, and so down here, you know, we have some, uh, let me show a more interesting example. Uh, so here is an example of a binary black hole collision where the um, we're, we're coloring the vertices in the hypergraph based on this conformal curvature parameter, based on this scalar parameter, and where the topology of the hypergraph is actually tracking that value. So you can see if, if we if we start, oh, hang on, wait, if I show up here, no, if just we just look, sorry? We didn't invite Jose to this, this um, uh, did we? I can check if he's available. Yeah, could you? That'd be great if he could join us. Sorry, he's a big expert on relativist, relativity computations. Um, okay, uh, please, if, please go if, on. Yeah. If we just show the hypergraph topology without any coordinate information, then you can see that even you know even without coordinatization, the topology of the hypergraph still tracks the value of that scalar parameter. So it kind of it, it morphs to to sort of fit the the, the, the structure of the solution. Because um, yeah. the the value is higher. Uh, why does it track the? Because the curvature. Well, it so, is so, determined from the hypergraph. Go ahead. No, well, be, be, because yeah, if if the as the as the value as the scalar parameter evolves, as the value gets higher in certain areas, the the, the hypergraph gets finer in those areas, and it, as it drops below a certain value in different areas, the hypergraph gets coarser in those areas. So what you find is that the regions. So so here where you have lots of hypergraph vertices, where so scalar you know, where, value correspond to shape, basically. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So that, that's that's the basic setup, but then the realization was, if we if we're gonna just refine the hypergraph based or refine or course in the hypergraph based on this scalar value, then in a sense we don't need the scalar value because we can always we can reconstruct approximately what that scalar value was just from the hypergraph topology, and then we just need to find a, a transformation rule on the hypergraph that produces the same effect on the hypergraph topology as you would have got if you evolved the scalar parameter using an ordinary PDE solver. And so- Because so your here, choice of scalar value was derived from the hypergraph. Yes, right, right. Or, or we, yeah, we've, we've chosen a, a scalar value that can be reconstructed from information of the, about the, you know, from information in the hypergraph. Well, we that, that's, the, it's not really us, it was old Albert who did that. I mean, cause it's the, you know, that's what the Einstein equations actually have in them. Right is geometrical information, but 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 the point the, the point I want to convey is actually that that's not specific to the Einstein equations. It, it, for any scalar parameter, it's possible to set the thing up in in, in that in that in that way. Um, so that's but, more impressive to me. So I, so I, I'm curious about that. But well, I'll, I'll show some examples of that in just a moment. So if if I show down here, so here here's now an example comparing. So here on the left, you've got the you've got the solutions computed using the PDE solver. On the right, you've got solutions computed just using pure hypergraph substitutions. You just have rules that say, take a you know sub hypergraph matching this pattern, replace the replace that with a sub hypergraph matching some different pattern, and you get uh, the same you know limiting geometries, uh, you know up, up to up to some scalar factor. Um, so, uh, which is, I think, which is what Stephen was talking about earlier. So, so this, so in, in, in these cases here, we are effectively throwing away the information about, we, we no longer have to equip the hypergraph with this additional scalar parameter information. We can just, we can reconstruct the scalar parameter information purely from the hypergraph topology and the evolution of that scalar parameter then just follows in accordance with uh, some evolution rule on the hypergraph. 
Um, so then the interesting thing, the interesting question would be, well, now suppose we did this for, suppose we took some hyperbolic system of equations that you know, wasn't the Einstein field equations and we picked some parameter there. So the example I worked with was, the example I've tried on so far is the, um, the, Euler, the standard Euler equations in an ideal fluid dynamics where your refinement criterion is no longer a curvature quantity, it's just the density value in the Euler equations. So, uh, which, which naturally, you know, anytime you have a sharp density wave, that means that there are going to be more hyper, you know, more hypergraph vertices in that region. And anyway, where you have smooth behavior and, and low densities, you, you'll have fewer hyper, uh, you know, you'll have fewer hyper edges and fewer vertices in, in those regions. So if I show, well, let me actually, let me show the, let me show the, the higher resolution example, because it may be easier to see what's going on. So here is a, um, a cylindrically symmetric uh, initial configuration for the two-dimensional Euler equations. So we've just got a we've got a high high density region in the center and low density regions outside. This is what the initial topology, the, you know, the original the initial hypergraph topology looks like. Uh, this corresponds to the this is a Riemann pro this is a two-dimensional version of a Riemann problem that comes from uh, Tito Tito Toro's book about uh, the Euler equations and approximate Riemann problems. Um, so then at some intermediate time step, so, so what's going to happen here is that this is going to induce three waves. There's going to be a, a, a fast moving shock wave, there'll be an intermediate contact wave, and then there'll be a slow moving refraction wave. After an intermediate time step, you, you start to see that separation. So you've got the shock wave at the front here uh, in blue, you've got the contact wave in yellow, and you've got the rare refraction wave in orange, although it's hard to see the separation. But uh, at, at the final time step, it becomes very clear that these, these, these three waves have indeed separated. You've got the shock here, the contact here, and the, and the rare refraction wave there. Um, so this is this is a eight, this is for a mesh resolution of 800 vertices. If we looked at the same thing without coordinate information, just looking at the hypergraph topology, again, you, you can see, you know, even without coordinates, you start to see the structure of the solution just in terms of the topology. You can see, you know, here's the rarefaction wave, here's the, here's the contact wave, here's the shock wave. And uh, so it, if we go to lower resolutions, of course, it, the, the, the separations between the waves become uh, less clear. Uh, so like that's- Sorry, I, I got a question. Is this, is this in 3D and you're projecting or is it actually, are you doing a 2D thing here? Right. Okay. So, so uh, very good question. In in the Einstein equation case, that was a three dimensional solution, but we're projecting it onto a two D surface. For the Euler equations, this is an intrinsically two D problem. Okay, it's a it, it's a two dimensional you. problem with enforced cylindrical symmetry. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. That's a good question. And then yeah, so so like in the two dimensional sorry in for the for the two hundred vertex case you start to get slightly poorer separation between the contact and the shock. And, in, and for 100 vertices, there, there's, barely, there's basically no separation at all. You can barely make out that there's anything going on because it's, it's so low resolution. But, what is uh, the but, coloring? What, how, how are you coloring the vertices here? Oh, this is density. This is density. So, so, um, what does that so mean? It, I mean, what, what does density mean? I mean, all you, all you can measure is geodesic balls. You're not, you're not, there are no actual coordinates for these points, right? Or are there still actual coordinates here? Well, there the, there are actually. So when when we're when we're doing it when we're doing the coordinatized version, right? When 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 we're solving the underlying PE system, we have coordinates. Okay, so, fine. So, so the, okay, here's the point. So, so you know, the Euler equations evolve density, pressure, uh, volume. Uh, sorry, density, pressure, velocity. Um, so then uh, we're, we're using density as our refinement criterion, and so then, given that the so so regions which have more Hypergraph vertices will therefore have higher density. You know, where, where regions where there's higher hypergraph connectivity will have higher density by definition because we're refining the hypergraph based on the density parameter. So just like we reconstruct the curvature using the geodesic ball construction in the Einstein equation case, we can reconstruct the density using a geodesic ball construction in the Euler equation case. And that's how we're using that. That's the procedure we're using for, to color the hypergraph in the case where there are no coordinates, where it's just pure, um, you know, hypergraph evolution. Okay, so one thing that is probably obvious to you and me, Jonathan, but maybe not to the people here, is these hypergraphs are not. What once you remove the training wheels of having initial, co you know, having coordinates specified, these these hypergraphs are not any particular number of coordinates. So that has to emerge as well. Right. Right. Um, which, yeah, so which which has happened. So it's kind of interesting here that that even without coordinate information, you can still see that the you know the the, the uh, contact wave, the shock wave in particular, have, have kind of naturally made circular regions within this graph embed within the you know spring electrical graph embedding, um, which is kind of interesting, and it's not not obvious that would have happened. Um, right. 
but, but so, so you so you can actually see that these are these are more that you know if you look around the contact wave this is a more densely connected region of the hypergraph than like in between the contact wave and the shock um and and the reason is because we've picked a rule that you know that, that, that exhibits that particular behavior. So then we just need to look at the hypergraph connectivity dens uh, density if we want um, if we want to reconstruct the actual you know fluid density in that region. So where does the asymmetry come from? Is that is that in the initial condition? Uh, right. That's a good question. So um, when we okay. So yes, when we re when we construct the initial condition. So like hit, this is the initial condition, and you can see this is already sort of a, a, an asymmetrical thing. The reason is so how we set up initial data is a little bit different to how we do the rest of the evolution. So um, in and and the intuition for this again comes from the Einstein equations case. So what you what you have is we have a we have a Cauchy surface on which on which we define the initial data, and so in the Einstein equations case that's just some manifold, and there's a way if we if we have a manifold if we have some Riemannian manifold there's a kind of canonical way of constructing a hypergraph which limits to we can construct a hypergraph where the natural distance metric on the hypergraph is known to limit to the Riemannian distance metric on the manifold, and the way you do that is this procedure called sprinkling. Where you 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 just you define a Poisson point process on, on the manifold, and you sprinkle down points uh, in accordance with that point process. So so where the probability of a point existing within a region is proportional to the volume element on that manifold, um, and then you uh, so, so then you you've got some distribution of points on on that space, and then you just connect points together if and only if their distance with respect to the Riemannian metric is less than some cutoff value. And that gives you a hypergraph that, uh, that sort of whose metric, whose discrete metric approximates the continuous metric on the, on, the, on the surface. So that's an inherently probabilistic process. And for the setting up the initial conditions for the Euler equations, we're doing exactly the same thing, except that instead of thinking about it as being, you know, a, as being like, a, as being, a, instead of thinking of your Riemannian manifold as being a space-like hypersurface or something with, with a curvature, we're thinking of it as just being a Cauchy surface for the Euler, you know, a two-dimensional Cauchy surface for the Euler equations, where effectively evolution, uh, where, sorry, where, where elevation is given by uh, by fluid density, uh, but we're doing the same sprinkling process there. What do you mean elevation? You mean you mean the third-dimensional curvature, or what? What do you mean by elevation? Right. I think so, you so mean density. Yeah. Well, Look, it, it, I think you're using a non-uniform Poisson point process, so you mean density. Probably. Yes, right, right. So, so, so probability density in that region, which if you think of it, and again, if you think about it in terms of the, the Riemannian manifold case, that would just be a, play, a, a point on your manifold where you have a sort of a, a, a non-zero uh, extrinsic curvature, a non-zero elevation. Uh, but in the fluid dynamics case, yeah, as, as Roger says, it's basically, you know, it's, that's, that's just density. Um, so when you do these, when you, when you do these random, random setups, do you typically do, do several realizations to to see what the, the, the overall distribution is, or do you know enough about statistics to know that it's stable? Uh, we, we have numerical evidence that it's stable, but, the, 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 but there's no analytical proof. Well, I mean, there's a, look, the theorem level of this is if we assume certain statistical properties, then the limiting behavior must be right. Right, but but are you checking several realizations to make sure that that's correct? Then that's a different issue. That's a numerical analysis question, basically. Yeah, which, which, yeah, which, which I must admit we're not doing in the current version of the code. Okay, <laughs> All right. um, but it's a good idea. Right, but so I mean, you know, the the theorem status of all of this stuff is is probably pretty similar to you know, that old cellular automaton fluid dynamics stuff of mine from the 1980s. That is, if you can assume enough microscopic randomness, microscopic effective randomness, then the large scale limits work out. I don't know whether that's, I mean, I don't know how rigorously have you gone through that, Jonathan, for this, particularly for the non-Einstein equation case. I, I think for it's not, obviously going to work out, but anyway, keep going. Yeah. Yeah. For the non-Einstein equation case, not at all. Um, okay. I, I, this is, this is, I, I, I should come clean and say this this entire everything that isn't the Einstein equations, this is currently just me hacking around with stuff. There's no real rigor or system. I, uh, there's nothing very systematic going on there. So I was gonna well, I was gonna ask that how you how you take the, how the workflow is. If you get a PDE boundary value conditions, how do you how do you transform and set up the problem to right? Well, that's I think what we were hoping to discuss here. 
Right. I mean, well, I, I mean, s setting it up in this particular framework is not that complicated. I mean, as long as, as you know, you as long as you can represent it as a as a you know conservative uh, hyperbolic PDE system, then uh, then it works just fine. And as long as you have so, as long as you have some distinguished scalar parameter that you want to refine by, then setting up the numerical solver is 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 very straightforward. Finding do care, a why do you care about hyperbolic? Uh, well, so right now. The particular, the underlying numerical solver only works for hyperbolic equations, nice. uh, because it's it, it's a, a as um, so. Uh, Rob was mentioning we we were discussing this before the stream. It's you know right now. So the way I enforce numerical stability, for instance, is, is via a Coran condition, and you know. The, ah, the, well, that's that's certainly locked in. Yeah. Yeah, the, the CFL number kind of only makes sense for hyperbolic systems. Yeah. Um, and it, it, there's actually a more fundamental conceptual problem as well. Which is that okay? So imagine what would happen if you take the limit as this goes to some elliptic uh, system. Well, then if you want to, it, once you get to the point where you want to define this in term, just purely in terms of hypergraph transformation rules, the size of your hypergraph transformation rules becomes unbounded, right? Because for oh elliptic, yeah, right. For an elliptic, reaches much farther. It's not as local. Is what you mean? Right. Exactly. For an elliptic problem, you, you're defining a rule that acts on the entire hypergraph, which is kind of not very useful. I, I don't think that's the right way to think about elliptic problems. I think the right way to think about them is just like, you know, like running a Turing machine is like a hyperbolic problem. Uh, making a tiling that has certain conditions is like an elliptic problem. Yeah, but you right. should be able to run, you should be able to handle parabolic problems. I mean, I mean, the problem is the time step restriction is even more severe, but Right. In principle, it's possible. Yeah, absolutely, and, and um, yeah, I think I think running, you know, running a heat equation or something is is the is an obvious yeah. next step. Well, and and, and in some sense, an, an elliptic problem is is the the infinite time limit of a parabolic problem. So, right, I mean, not that that's what you want to do it. <laughs> Good. I mean, if it's all discrete, why not just run it to its limit, fixed point? It's very long. I mean, there's there, there there is a there is a standard. I mean, uh, probably Rob and or Oliver and or Roger will will may, may know this method better than I do. But there, there's at least in in the numerical relativity community, there is at least a standard uh, numerical approach for converting elliptic problems to hyperbolic problems, which is this projection method, where you sort of you effectively like in, in the fluid dynamics case, the way you would do it is you'd say I introduce an artificial compressibility parameter, and I solve it as though it were hyperbolic. And then I project the solution onto some space of approximately divergence-free vector fields, and that gives me a solution to the original elliptic problem. Um, so there are ways of getting around it. But so R on our live stream is asking various questions about uh, uh, you know what assumptions are going in and how is it different from valid elements and so on. I mean, just to explain the kind of the conceptual point here, I mean, the original reason for doing this is to be able to understand. Uh, the uh, the way in which our models of fundamental physics reproduce things with the Einstein equations and things with general relativity as a as a sort of uh, uh, you know this sort of a practical connection between our underlying model and and uh, physics. Part of the point of that is, you know, normally when you're solving the Einstein equations, you say the Einstein equations are given. Now we're going to do numerical analysis and uh, discretize them. And hopefully the solutions we get will be the same as the solutions that we would get were we able to solve the true continuous problem. Our situation is different because we believe we, that, the, that the, this, these models are actually what's going on underneath physically. Just like if you were to solve an approximate fluid, fluid problem using molecular dynamics, you believe the molecular dynamics is ultimately what's actually going on in the fluid system. So if there's a disagreement between the molecular dynamics prediction and the prediction from solving, you know, discretized Navier-Stokes, what's happening probably is the physics diverges between the continuum approximation and the true thing that's there. So one of the motivations for us is, is can we find out that we are accurately reproducing the Einstein equations in cases where uh, you know, where that is what is physically observed. And then what happens in, in weird limiting cases where you start to see through to the discrete, you know, atoms of space, so to speak. Just like in hypersonic flow in fluid dynamics, you see through the, um, uh, the, the continuous fluid behavior and down into the molecular scale. And so that's so, but, you know, the side effect of all of this is 
this is potentially an interesting practical scheme to solve these kinds of equations, having nothing to do with the fact that this that the you know the underlying dynamics here might be more physically correct than the underlying dynamics from the numerical analysis of a continuous equation. Although recognizing the fact that in the actual physical case, you know, the, the length scales that might be relevant are things like 10 to the minus 100 meters. So in an actual numerical approximation, you will not even be close to getting the realistic kind of length scales associated with actual physical situations. So anyway, that, that's just the point of... Um, uh, um, um, you know, that's um, uh, that, that's kind of the the conceptual architecture of what's going on. So, I mean, for us, you know, we think we have a, a a proof that in an appropriate limit with certain molecular chaos assumptions, the limiting behavior of these systems for the Einstein equations will be the correct continuum limit. Of course, those molecular chaos assumptions aren't exactly correct, just as they're not exactly correct from molecular dynamics either, but they seem to be good enough. And certainly when you have 100 orders of magnitude of limits being taken, um, you know, that's that's pretty good bet. But then the question is, to what extent can we, you know, can we validate that proof by doing explicit simulations? That's always a good thing to do. And, you know, then can we look at effects which kind of uh, probe underneath the continuum limit? And then can we turn this into a practical method where we don't have to have 100 orders of magnitude between the underlying atoms of space and the continuum behavior. And I mean, maybe it'd be useful, Jonathan, I mean, you, you were looking at some things like black hole ring down type things um, and getting evidence that, that you could get those from this kind of analysis in pretty much the same way you can get them from numerical solutions to Einstein's equations, which right. I consider to be highly encouraging. Right, I, I, can, I can show some examples. I mean, so like that, that's a, that's a gravitational wave signature computed just using hypergraph evolution. Uh, whereas up here somewhere, we have the associated, that's the, that, that's the same signature computed using an ordinary numerical, or, you know, say, you know a, a standard numerical relativity scheme. Um, so we, and they, they do indeed converge to the same values just with slightly different orders of convergence. I want to know what happens if you like change the the angular momenta and the sizes of these black holes and things. Like, if you have two very unequal sized black holes, I don't know what this. What does this ring down thing look like? Uh, that's a good question. I I, I don't know. I mean, I, I tested it. Yeah, for for, for equal mass, uh, non rotating and rotating, um, but but not not for unequal mass cases. What is the what is the basic physics? I mean, so in in real terms, if these are a couple of solar mass black holes. The time scale of this of these oscillations is on the order of a couple of seconds. Is that correct? A few seconds. Right. right. It, it's it's generally we're, we're we're talking a couple of orders of magnitude longer time scale than the actual collision. Normally. Okay, but I mean the the speed of light propagating on the surface of the black hole. How big is the black hole? It's like a kilometer or so. What what is the size? Uh, I'm using dimensionless coordinates here, so I don't know. I mean, that's, every, everything is defined in terms of the ADM mass for this particular simulation. Does Jose maybe know what the actual, I, I think it's like a kilometer for a, a couple of solar mass black hole. Yes, okay. for, for, for a solar mass size, yes, it's about um, one or two kilometers. Okay, so what, what sets the time scale for the ring down of a second or two? Because the speed of light on the surface of that black hole is, I mean, you know, it's funky that there's a speed of light there at all. But I mean, if you just look at the, the basic, you know, time scales, why isn't that on the order of, of, um, you know, uh, you no, know, if it's a kilometer, it's like um, ten to the minus five seconds or something. Right. Well, I think it is, it is faster than that. I mean, it's, it's, uh, and I would say it's, it's much shorter than a second. What do you mean? That the, but the oscillation time for these actual gravitational wave emissions are on the order of seconds, right? No, I think it's faster. I thought the original black hole observation by LIGO was like a 2.5 second ring down. Has, has that been redshifted? How could it be redshifted? It's, it's, wait a minute. 
Uh, it's an interesting question, isn't it? It was a third of the way across the universe, so it might have been, but but let me think about that for a second. All, all I'm saying is just, just even if the reading was 2.4 seconds, that doesn't mean the actual ring down was necessarily. Yeah, it's an interesting point. So how much time dilation was there in the translation from the rest frame of the black holes to our rest frame? Right. Um... Hmm. Okay, well, the, the, okay, right. Separately, something to look up. But, 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 I mean, you think, you believe that the basic story is there are sort of ripples on the surface of the black hole that are propagating more or less at the speed of light. Is that, um, I mean, the, the, the speed of sound on the black hole surface is of the order of the speed of light. Is that, is that right, or is that... Um, uh, I think that's correct. Okay, okay. But so, so I'm just trying to understand, as we take this numerical scheme, so to speak, or the scheme, and we start putting it into more extreme domains, what's going to happen to it? Right. Like, what, what happens when, the, when the, roughly, when the black holes... Um, it would be fun to to uh, simulate one of those kind of gravitational kick things, right? Where you get you get a smaller one that gets thrown out from some in spiral. What happens there? The, you, you know, you you have a you have an in spiral of a smaller black hole into a larger one, and then and and, and at, at some and there's a essentially there's a critical phenomenon where you know eventually the the, the smaller one can get kicked out to to. Well, there's it. angular momentum in the bigger one. Right. Right. I see. And can you only get one? You know, one splash, black hole splash? Or can you get a full sort of splash where you get some instability and there are lots of little black holes produced? Uh, I don't think that can happen, but H Jose might be able to correct me. Um, sorry, c c can you ask a question again? So the question is if you if you are pouring a small black hole into a rapidly rotating black hole, yep. uh, Jonathan was talking about the phenomenon where a little black hole gets bounced out of that process. And I'm asking, can you have a full splash, so to speak, where you get lots of little black holes produced? Lots of little black holes. What do you mean? I mean, a black hole is not going to break into, into several black holes. Well, I mean, I understand that's black hole thermodynamics would suggest that. Right? right, But what Jonathan is saying is that there is a situation with a rotating black hole with inspiraling into a rotating black hole where you can throw out a small black hole. Where, 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 the, where the one that's inspiraling can get thrown out, that is. Right. I mean, oh, before I see. they is merge. It? Oh, before the merger. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. So, so once they've merged, kind of black hole thermodynamics takes over and you just get a bigger black hole. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, I, I, maybe I, I wasn't clear. I, yeah, there, there's, okay, it's, right, there's, there's a third thing being produced. Yeah. Okay, but um, I mean, I guess the question, and this is now off topic for this meeting, and we should get back on topic, is you know, it would be really good to see some more extreme versions of this because you know, see, see, this is where everybody who does numerical schemes is always nervous to push their numerical scheme into weird, crazy regimes where it's going to break down, but that's exactly what we want to do here. Right, because right, right. the breakdown of the numerical scheme is seeing through physics that we wouldn't otherwise see. Now, I, the only I, I, I agree with the goal. It's just that I, I I'm the reason I'm nervous is just that I, I want to make sure that we have a robustly validated scheme before we start pushing it. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know, I know. I've heard this. I've heard this for like forty years from people who do numerical schemes for PDEs and, and where I'm interested in. But what about this physical phenomenon that you should be able to see? And they're like, no, no, no. Don't push the scheme too hard. <laughs> the, it's some. Um, it is interesting. It's a. It's a. Um, uh, a scheme protection scheme. Um, but but okay. But but so I mean, and one reason why I thought this discussion would be interesting is it would be really great to be able to get this thing well enough packaged that it will be easy to do a bunch of these experiments. So, I mean, I guess the question we can ask is, what, one thing is how the scheme actually works. Another is, what will be involved in packaging it in something like Oliver's framework so that it will be possible, you know, just as Oliver has, you know, a framework for representing PDE uh, system design with, you know, you know, sound absorbers and who knows what else. 
what will be involved in having something where you can set up the initial conditions as some kind of, you know, for gravitational initial conditions, basically. What will be the analog? Maybe, maybe Oliver could share for a second, just show off his uh, PDE system design. Okay. Uh, give me a second. Uh, so... So basically what we've done is we've started to, uh, uh, to collect different fields of physics where we try to um, make uh, applications. And um, we've tried to pour all of this into a kind of a, uh, a language to do PDE modeling. And um, so there is some basic um, fundamental operators like diffusion, convection, reaction operators and all of these models that we are making are based on these um, base operators so to speak so they're ex extending these fundamental uh, physics uh, operations so to source physics models if you will um, to to other domains and so let's maybe he transfers maybe a good example uh, let's see so what we do is then we have some, I mean, so I'm, 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 maybe I should, uh, should say this initially, I'm an engineer. And um, for me, the, the, the main thing is that I want to solve kind of real world problems where people have a very well-defined geometry and some defined initial and boundary conditions and they need to find uh, how the system physically behaves. So um, with these application examples, then we, we go off, we, we have, so, there's these, these heat transfer, um, um, transfer PD component. It's basically what does heat transfer modeling and you, you can you can look hey, at By the way, oh, why did you need that need statement? You don't need that anymore, do you? Well, yes, because we, we do fancy stuff with a finite element mesh. So that's, that's, uh, that's a needed thing. Um, we're not quite there yet to, to avoid that. Why so. don't you put it in the function repository? Why don't you put those additional functions in the function repository for now? Oh, but they're in the kernel. They're they're quite well there. Oh, it doesn't matter. I mean, then you can document them in the function repository. Oh, they're documented. They're they oh, also okay. documented. There. So why do you need needs if they're in the kernel? Because they're in the in the finite element context. I mean, you can make them system functions as you want. Right, but that's what yeah. I'm saying. On the, the on the reference page, Stephen, on the reference pages, there's no needs. We're it's only the, using system documented things. Yeah, these in are the, just in the monograph. Yeah, is still using some of that over time. That, okay, that fine. So it's a temporary thing. It's so a I'm temporary that, thing. That, then but, there is also for another group, which is sort of finite element specialists, there's a programming model at that level. For those guys, it won't probably ever go away because that gives... Fine, but I'm just saying that I think our modern way of doing that, instead of having a needs, is to put those things in the function, to expose them through the function repository. doesn't mean that they can't be implemented as kernel functions, but just to expose them and document them through the function repository. Okay, anyway, that's irrelevant to this topic. Yeah, okay. So, so this, this then is this uh, heat transfer PD component that um, you'll, you'll find the equations that it implements and how you set up the variables and parameters to, to make this work. Um, and the basic, uh, basic idea is the following. You, you, you have this heat transfer PD component, you have the dependent variable and the independent variable, and this one just doesn't have any specif um, specifications. And this one here, you specify the mass density to be raw, uh, specific heat capacity, whatever, whatever is needed to, to specify an equation in a certain field of physics. And it's going to spit out to you um, the actual equation that, uh, that you want to solve. And that's basically how we then, uh, that's what we plug into and dissolve to, um, to find the solution for. So that's kind of um, the idea. Now, this is, this is the part, so you'll see that this is not an equation. This is just a component. So you, you'll need to mash this up with some other things to, to make this a complete problem. And that's the boundary conditions. Um, so if you, um, I think we'll probably have- If this was in an infinite domain, this thing would just be equal to zero. Is that true? What do you mean? Well, I mean- This is the heat equation. Right, so yeah. the heat equation, it has some initial data, and then in, if there's no source of heat, yeah. then this thing, this 
the equations for the system would just be heat transfer PD component blah 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 equals zero to zero. Yes, yeah, so if you don't have any 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 surface uh, effects or something like that, that's correct. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So um, and so here here we have the equation that we specify here with the um, variables and parameters, and we set it to zero just like you said. But it's also it has a heat source, so that's but that's a PDE component, so to speak. And then we specified um, a heat um, temperature condition, which is a, a Dirichlet condition, and say that at one point uh, at x equals zero, so on the left hand side, it's set to zero, and that's th that's then how the equation uh, comes out. So this framework, um, this PDE modeling framework, basically has these kind of operations for different fields of physics. So we have heat transform, we have mass transport, um, acoustics. Uh, um, so, so those are the ones that are currently okay, so, live. So just, just for the sake of amusement, let's think about what this would look like for, for general relativity. What would be the analogs of those kinds of things? So there would be a thing that has uh, you know, the, your heat source here would be a piece of energy momentum, a piece of mass, probably. And you could define where that is. Um, as a... That, 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 surely we, we want to be able to handle vacuum solutions as well. We do. Yes, we do. So far, all we've done is handle vacuum solutions. Um, right. But so, so mean, my question would be, go ahead. I mean, basically, the first thing I think... Um, so if, if, you, if you've done... Um, the Einstein um, equations. Then I'd, I'd start by doing by by setting up um, the PDE or or the, the yeah the PDE for this uh, this equation, and then um, expand it from there. So you start, you have an you call initially call it Einstein PDE component, whatnot. It doesn't matter. You can change mm -hmm. that later, and then um, start to to specify what parameters this this equation has and fill those out. So it, it doesn't have a thermal conductivity. It has some kind of a mass, I assume, some uh, some um, curvature tensors and things like that. Um, and that that you you do that you you you'd expand on that. The question um, I'm not I'm, I mean I'm not a, a physicist, so I, I don't know if if you can build the Einstein equation from the basic base operators that I've implemented for the for the um, engineering. No, you type cannot. Of no, you can't. Not these specific ones. So you'd you'd have to extend those then a bit too, but right. that's not not impossible either. So, I mean, so. the the boundary conditions are a little bit of a weird story because in general relativity. You know, well, okay, relativist folk talk about that. I mean, you'd presumably have, uh, you know, what on earth is the analog of the boundary conditions? I mean, there's the whole cosmological boundary. There's the well, whole, we, go ahead. You have, you have boundary conditions in exactly the same way in, in GR. I mean, it was like, it, for, you know, for, for the simulations shown in that paper, I used the, the um, uh, Sommerfeld radiative boundary conditions, but you can. So that's, you can a, that's a radiation type of boundary condition. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So some of the radiation yes, sure. So do you have those, Oliver? No, I have. A, I don't have a Sommerfeld radiation condition. I have a different radiation condition. Sommerfeld is something we could or should do at some stage, probably. But currently, the um, there's some technology missing for doing that. But it's in principle, it's an important boundary condition, of course. Yes. Can you show the radiative one that you do have? Uh, yeah. Let me quickly see. Uh, so I should say that there, that case is the easy one in relativity. So the, the difficult boundary cool. condition is the singularity. And then yeah. the most complicated part that relativity adds in all of this is the gauge choice. Which so, they presumably have in electromagnetism as well. How do you make gauge choices? If you're solving Maxwell's equations, Oliver, you must have to make a choice for the electric potential, for example, that has an, well, the electric potential might just have an arbitrary constant, but there may be more complicated gauge choices. There are for electromagnetic waves, I think. Um, yeah, but we haven't tackled that yet. We just started with electromagnetics. I don't, I, we haven't sorted this out yet. So this is but, something. Uh, but how do you, I mean, is it the case that you have gauge choice issues? Is that what yes, you call Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And so, so just to give me a sense, I mean, in, like in the engineering literature, what would be names of typical gauge conditions and things? I don't know. Okay. I don't Dirac, know. Lorenz, Coulomb. Yeah, Vial, multipolar. Okay. 
I, I yeah, I mean, th these these are quite uh, particularly in areas like MH like astrophysical MHD. This is something people care about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so radiation conditions. So radiation yeah. conditions. So on the left hand side, you have um, so in the finite element work uh, world, this um, there is a. Um, a strong relation between the Neumann value and the actual PDE. So this is this here is the um, diffusive term, so to speak, this part here, the conduction term. And this this part here is is related by the method, by the derivation of the method to the Neumann value. So this part here is something you never explicitly specify. It's just given by the method. So this, this is just a, um, um, a written representation of the Neumann value, but this is the actual thing that, that's computed. So you have an epsilon, which is a, a visibility parameter. It's between one and zero. It's how much of the, of the stuff uh, hits the surface or comes from the surface. Stefan Boltzmann constant. Um, this is the ambient temperature minus the reference temperature. And then this is the, the dependent variable minus the reference temperature to the power of four. So it's a power of four type of law. Uh, for the radiation. Okay, yeah. but so in the in the relativistic case, what you're basically saying, so but okay, so Jose made the comment that these radiative boundary conditions are the easy ones. What on earth do singularity boundary conditions look like? So we don't put we don't okay. put boundary conditions exactly at the singularity. So what we do is that we put them around, and there are two techniques. So one is to say that because the horizon doesn't let information go out, we just put in a boundary condition and in going boundary condition a bit inside the horizon. And so the difficult thing here is to keep in track where the horizon is. So in going meaning a radiation boundary condition of some kind. A radiation, exactly. It's an ingoing radiation, exactly. Instead of the outgoing radiation at infinity, it's an ingoing a little bit inside the horizon. The other technique, which is called a puncture, is to have an analytic approximation to the singularity and then match to that. And then your okay. problem is that you have to keep moving. You have to keep knowing where to put that analytic singularity. So these are the two main techniques. But in the, in the first case, the horizon is dynamic. Is that true? So you have yes. to... Uh, I see. And so you, have to, you need a very good uh, horizon uh, finder, tracker. And then you put the... Um, the, the boundary condition, the ingoing boundary condition, a little bit inside. This technique is called excision. But so roughly, using, go, go ahead. Is this using something like a level set on Iconol equations to track the surface? Like free surface flow or something like that? I bet um, they're just measuring, they're just having light cones and they just see where the light cones, which, whether they make it out or not. Is no, that no, true? But, but, but in, in practical numerical relativity codes, it is quite common to have, uh, to, if you have an apparent horizon finder, to represent it as the zero contour of some scalar field, like, yes, like, okay. like in a level yeah. set. Yeah, yeah. okay. And, and then, and then the, the same kind of issues happen. So you know, when, you're, when you're trying to track the, the apparent horizon, you, you, know, you face similar kinds of reinitialization, renormalization problems yeah. that you would. You, you, could, you might want to try actually iconal type equations uh, with your system because it's, um, it should do well for convection dominant stuff. So, right. but, um, I, but iconal equations are really easy to recast as, as hyperbolic systems, which is kind of cheating. Even the better. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. No, it's, it's Remind me, so iconal equations, that's the imaging equations in, in optics, for example, yes? Or something different? I mean, the, the, the original meaning of the iconal approximation and iconal equations is imaging and optics, but do they mean something different? I mean, so I, they, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, my, my understanding is it's just a you know, generic equation of the form like grad phi is one or something. Yes, exactly. And that you can use that for, for free surface flow detection or level set um, following. That's how you propagate a level set, okay. uh, like a contour. So if you, if you do free surface flow, fluid, fluid dynamics with bubbles and whatnot, that's how it's typically done. That's one of the methods to do it. But what, one of the cool things about the iconal equation is that even though it's elliptic, you can construct an equation that's like uh, d phi by d tau uh, plus grad phi minus one e equals zero or something. And then just, so which is hyperbolic in tau and then just evolve that until you reach a steady state. And so it's a way of solving. Yeah, you, you can separate it from the other equations in that way as well. So that's, right. that's useful, yeah. All right, so let me... Let me but we don't do any of that. I, you know, Oliver, we don't do any of that 
that moving surface business now, right? No, we can't because um, the finite element method is not well suited for convection dominant flow and that the iconal equation is purely convectional. So that, that's, uh, that's where people, that's why people invented discontinuous Galerkin methods because they're extremely well suited ah, for that right. type of problem. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you, you, can, you can do it and the way we would do it now if we didn't have another method would be that we um, do use the finite element method and then a few, every few times that we need to reinitialize the method. Um, something like within one event uh, and when that triggers, then the, 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 the equation needs to be reinitialized. Mm -hmm. that, so that's it's. I think it's in theory it's doable to do, uh, but I just haven't done it yet. So, so Oliver, but, just but then we want to get to multi multi physics here, even for you know mixed yeah, relativity. Yeah, yeah. So this with... this is this is the idea. If we do fluid dynamics, then this is the thing that we're going to have to to look at how how we're going to do um, free surface flow um, within the framework. It's possible. I've done I've I've done my thesis on that, so I know it's possible, but it's a bit messy with a finite element method. So we'll need to to think a bit about that. I wasn't thinking specifically for that. I was thinking that one big advantage of having a modular language like this is that we built it from the get-go to be able to mix different kinds of physics. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. So, and, so, and in practice, you, often, you you do want that. Like in practice, you want thermal and fluid properties. And absolutely. Stuff. Absolutely. Okay. So but let me same. just understand it uh, operationally. If, if we were going to try a, a high wire act of putting some of Jonathan's technology into, you know, making a way to access Jonathan's solver within Oliver's framework and potentially adding at least a toy version of a relativistic, you know, general relativistic, uh, you know, analog of Oliver's framework, what would it look like? That, I mean, maybe maybe I can ask a question before that. So I'm I mean, as again, I'm not a physicist. So the 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 the, um, the equations, um, the Einstein equations, can they be cast in differential form? Yes, the yep. differential equations. Yep. And what's the highest spatial derivative that's present in them? Second the spatial and, and second spatial and, and time too. Yep. Okay. So that's it's it's, hi it's, hi it's hyperbolic. So the difficult thing with the Einstein equations is that they are what we say, what we call geometric. And so they are not naturally implementable in numerics. So you have to choose a framework. You have to choose these gauge conditions, which are a lot more complicated than electromagnetism. You have to choose four. Okay. And so there are many formalisms. And this is where most of the complication in general relativity is choosing the good formalism you want for your equations. But then in the end, you end up with hyperbolic mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. type, nonlinear, second order, quasi-linear equations. I mean, e even that, that could be part of the framework. So if we have something like a, a, a Einstein PDE component, you could have a, a, a parameter like a model form saying this should be in Lorentzian coordinates. So I don't know what, what, what the framework would be called. I don't know. But you, and you would generate different type of PDEs then from that. Would that make, would that be useful? Mm. Yeah, yes. I mean, th there are these famous, um, I, I, you know, I think Jonathan is working with BSSN and C4, conformal, things like that. So frameworks, which are well known and much used in the community, and yeah. having them encoded. But, but I think the interest, the, the thing here is, you know, we have this kind of newfangled way of doing specifically the Einstein equations, but su we suspect it's more general than that. And we should talk about some of the other, look, the other, the other case that looks somewhat accessible is stress equations. Um, and maybe, go ahead. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it for generalizing things. Absolutely. That's, uh, I like doing that, but I think it would be useful to have a simple example first and then we can see how it works and then expand on that learn a bit by that simple example and then go from there right but I it, think doesn't, that, it, it doesn't have to be the einstein equation it can be something simpler even it's not uh I, i'd strongly recommend if we want a minimal example but we don't use the einstein equation yes <laughs> okay um, we can agree on that that's good <laughs> I, I, think, I think the euler equations would, would be a good place to start yeah, i mean yeah. they're, they're, they're sure. non-linear they, 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 they you know they, they have weak solutions that there's interesting stuff but they're not super complicated and can, you don't have a 
sure. can you do can you do simpler like simpler than that like wave equations is that possible it is possible so like i i looked at sort of like coupled advection equations and things you know even simpler than wave equations and okay like wave equations and stuff. then um, maybe we should start with something as simple as possible um and see how how it pans out so that we, we get out of the way all all weird hurdles that we might encounter a simple uh, a simpler problem is better and i think rob would agree with me on that one but so in terms of the plug-in to your uh you know framework oliver yeah you know if you've got a different solver that has nothing to do with finite elements or anything yeah. like that how how clean is the api for plugging in a completely different kind of solver Okay, so this this is a so this this PD components they don't have to do any have anything to do with the solver that just gives the equation. So what we're now talking about is how we could would get something like this into ND solve, correct? I think that's a high hurdle. I mean, yes. I, I wouldn't you know I, I don't think that's the I think the well, place to go. Go it, ahead. It is Stephen, but it isn't. It's you know so 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 ND solve. You know, and, and this is something we did, you know, Mark and I did 15 or 20 years ago is we, we sort of separated any solve into various phases. I mean, one, one is the basic, you know, basic parsing of equations and canonicalizing into, into differential equations in a particular way. And that's, that's what Oliver's framework uses is that. So he, he generates equations and then we, you know, we parse them into, into particular forms. And I think this, this could take advantage of that as well. But from that point, so once you have some, you know, canonical sense of the equations, then you'd have to go to a completely, because because you're you're in a mesh free format, right? So so how yeah, do but you then, know? okay. So where does the geometry come in? Because this is, yeah. you know, let's say there were boundary conditions. Yep. How on earth, Jonathan, how on earth does that work? I mean, that's not what this has been set up for, right? To have something with actual, you know, you've got um, a wave equation in a box or something, you know, mm -hmm. waves in a pentagon or something like that. I mean, we, we, we have boundary conditions. It's, it's a PD solver. Well, so the way it would look is... Like the, re the reason for using radiative boundary conditions was that I initially ran the simulations with periodic boundary conditions and that perhaps unsurprisingly dramatically reduce the, you know, the, the, the stable time scales because you ended up having, you know, boundary effects that affected yes. physical variables and things. Okay. But, 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 but so the picture one should have then is there's a hypergraph, you know, you're solving something like the wave equation inside a pentagon. Okay. The big difference between what you're doing and the usual thing is that mesh, that hypergraph is not, let's say, two-dimensional. It's a, it's just a graph, right? I mean, that's the big technical difference, if I'm understanding correctly, with what people who do finite elements or whatever are used to. Yeah. Jonathan, is that, and, and so, so a question, Jonathan, is how far away, you know, if you measure the effective dimension of the thing, how far away from two would it get? Right. Do we so, understand so I, how that works? Right. So, so, oh. so I, I did this in preparation for the fluid dynamics case. So around a shock wave, uh, the effective dimension go, gets pretty high. Um, so like the, the, the shock waves from those two-dimensional Riemann, sol uh, Riemann problem solutions for the Euler equations, the effective dimension around the shock you know, reaches about 2.8 or something, um, mm -hmm. which is... Okay. I don't, know, I don't know if there's anything to read into that, but... Well, let's think about that for a second. I mean... Okay, reminder for people who haven't been following this whole thing, how do we measure effective dimension, okay? We're measuring within the graph, we're measuring the uh, growth rate of a geodesic ball, where a geodesic ball means you, uh, from a given point in the graph, you're going a certain graph distance away and you're asking how many nodes lie within graph distance R or something of a particular node, right? And you're looking at the growth, the R to the D growth rate of that. So what Jonathan is saying is, near a shock in fluid mechanics, you're observing a, well, I mean, essentially what's happening is that the system is trying to do an adaptive grid, so to speak, where the grid is both of higher density and of higher dimension, right? I mean, you would expect 
a grid of higher density, you don't necessarily expect a grid of higher dimension. Well, the the, the point is that anytime you have a di- anytime you have a density gradient, you get an increase in effective dimension, right? If you if you just take t- if you take two grids where one is denser than the other, they can both have the same dimension. That's if they're uniformly denser. Right? Yeah, but I, if, sorry. Can, can can I understand this this um this effect of um, um density and um, um, spatial order. Can I understand this as a as a as a different t- order in the method? Like uh, you have uh, seventh order at some specific point where there's lots of action, and uh, a lower order at some other point. Is that equivalent? I'm not sure that it, it's certainly related. I'm not sure that it's equivalent. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So, but your system is trying to resolve. The, the fact that lots of things are happening at the point. So it's going to subdivide like crazy. Exactly, exactly. And and that you interpret that as dimension somehow. Well, that's not necessarily the case because the pure density... Okay, what is density in a hypergraph? You know, a hypergraph has no intrinsic notion of length. So density is kind of... You know, it has to be relative to something. Otherwise, it's just, you know, you have a grid and the grid has some number of nodes in it, but you have no sense of how that grid maps into a fixed ruler, so to speak. No, no, the, the, the point I was making was that, you know, density, so density is in terms of if, if I go out graph distance R, you know, how many vertices do I encounter, right? That, that, that's the density. So the, the thing that, that determines the, the dimension is the exponent of that leading order term in, in, in that expansion. So what you care about is not density in any absolute sense. What you care about is density gradients. And so the point is that when you have a shot, you have effectively almost like a kind of domain wall between two, you know, a region of comparatively low density and a region of comparatively high density. Because you know, the, in, in principle, the shock is an infinitesimally thin thing. Um, and so, so that means that as you try and compute the dimension across that domain wall, the dimension will appear to be higher. Right, because you. You've got so, to... if you had, I mean, it sounds to me a little bit like you're trying to resolve a discontinuity with a continuous thing, and it's it's gonna t- try to sample like crazy. Exactly. That's yeah. true. Yeah, right. that's right. But the thing that's very unusual, right, is that usually, you know, if we're sampling a, um, uh, let's say we're making a two-dimensional plot. Okay, you know, we're making f of x, y, you know, z equals f of x, y. Okay. And it turns out that varies rapidly. Well, then we sample more, more points in x and y. But this isn't the same thing. This is because there isn't an x and y in this case. It's sampling. I don't know quite how to explain it properly. I mean, it, it's more obvious in the general relativity case what's going on. I mean, you're, you're, you're basically sampling... You're sampling points. Okay, okay, here's what it is. Usually, when you set up PDEs, it's geometry first, Mm -hmm. PDE second, okay? This is effectively the other way around. It's PDE first, geometry second. So in other words, the geometry is this thing that is being only approximately constructed. And then you're you're coming back and saying, well, actually, these values of X and Y in the, you know, these coordinates – geometrical coordinates can be deduced from the structure of the hypergraph in this way. Whereas in the traditional PDE situation, space is a given and you're simply meshing it in some fashion. Jonathan, do you think that's a correct description? Uh, Yeah, at least that's an important part of it, yeah. But when I heard Jonathan describe first what he does uh, right now, that sounded like it would slot into the way N-Diesel works. You know, let's say that you have geometry specified over which you want to solve your PDE. You, have, you might have a modeling language that makes it easier to specify it, like we've been seeing here. But you basically have a PDE boundary condition over a geometry. You mesh that first, and you're going to apply your boundary condition at the appropriate spaces in your, you know, that results in a graph, like Jonathan does right now. He has to apply them somewhere, those boundary conditions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he can go to town and sort of let go of their geometry and evolve like he does now. Okay, so Oliver here is showing a typical 
you know, refined mesh. Yeah, so this is basically, uh, this is for a, uh, let me show you quickly. This is a, a test problem. It has an arc tongue um, uh, discontinuity um, at uh, there. Uh, here, there's a discontinuity. Mm -hmm. And um, this is an example where the adaptive mesh refinement will just continue to refine. And at some point you'll just have to say, no, this is enough now. So it says now, okay, I, it doesn't make sense to refine more because uh, yeah, um, that's it. So that, that's how adaptive mesh refinement looks, in, uh, looks like in, in, in finite element method. It tries to, to figure out what is the gradient? Um, how much does the gradient change? Do I get a better result if I refine that area? Um, yeah. yeah, that's kind of what it does. So in Jonathan's analog of this, and maybe Jonathan actually has pictures to show this, this just wouldn't stay two-dimensional. Right, right. Well, I mean, it, it wouldn't, what, once, the point is once you've generated the mesh, it's, it's not even exactly two-dimensional then, right? It, it's going to be two-dimensional plus or minus something. Right. But that picture would then be, it would kind of, you know, you wouldn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a planar graph. It's, you know, it's just a general graph. But then to know, once you do the solution of the PDE, then you have to map it back onto the geometry. Right, right. So, so like, um, if I, hang on. If I took something like this and I projected it just onto a two-dimensional plane, right, w w without elevating the thing based on density, then you would see there's there's a higher debt you know th there would be more points in the central region than than, than in the outside regions just because this yep. was, we're taking more samples there right so, so right. It, is it is it more points or do the points have more connectivity as well uh it, it's it's both um okay and so when you do it's, it's, see that's the thing i'm a little bit lost on here is you you say you're a shock you get this you know dimension 2.8 or something so so I don't quite see how the adaptivity scheme adds additional connectivity. Right, right. Okay. So, so, so what's happening is so, um, like I said, the, the the way that because of the way we set up the initial conditions, right? We're, what we're doing is we're we're effectively assigning a discretization cutoff, and we're saying any points that lie within this distance of each other, we're going to treat as being adjacent. Mm -hmm. So then, it, so so inevitably, in the case where we have coordinate information. As you increase the number of points in some region, they're going to become more densely connected because they're, you know they're 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 going to be closer together, right? So 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 more of them are going to be connected than if they were, uh, you know, than if they were more sparsely distributed. Um, that's all that's happening. So you just have some distance threshold below which they're considered connected. It, exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes. That that makes sense now. Then thanks. Okay, but I find this an intriguing, this notion of d dimension, whether it's, I mean, I, I don't, I can't make my mind up whether it's sort of artificial or real. Um, what aspect of it? No, I mean, so you can very well have a mesh without any embedding, you know, yes. like a pure graph. Absolutely. But you don't normally but, consider that in the PDE world, right? No. No, we don't. Right. Okay, fine. Um, Because basically it's geometry first, PDE second, normally. Yeah, and I think what, the reason is to, yeah. um, to, to map it back to, to a geometry. I mean, you, because the, the final result, you want that on the geometry. Exactly, right. But, but, that's, but the whole point is in our physics project, that's been the story of the physics project is basically to figure out how a hypergraph can map to actual spatial geometry. So Jonathan, maybe maybe here's a question. Maybe you can help me with that one. So um, say you want to solve any PDE with your system. Do, do you think in any ways in terms of, of a region over which you want to solve this PDE? And if so, how how do you map this region into your, in, or how do you generate the hypergraph from that region? Right, okay. So, so do, do you mean that in the sense of um, you, are you thinking about a region kind of immersed in some background space where only the where the PDE is only being solved in that region, or are you just are you asking a more basic thing like how do I construct a region that, you know how do I construct a hypergraph that approximates a given spatial region? Um, so basically, if, say you want to solve a wave equation over a, over a disk or something like that. How do you map that disk into into the hypergraph? Oh, okay, that, that's easy to hang on. Wait, give me one second. I can pull yeah. something up. Um, 
if I say, I mean, the follow-up question then is, is, is there a reverse mapping for that? So. Oh yeah, that, that, the, the inverse problem is really complicated. Um, okay. So, <laughs> so, hang on. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the forward problem at least is actually quite straightforward. So it, okay, it, okay. It, if, if I say there's a, there's a function in the function repository, which is just ext extrinsic curved manifold to graph. So I specify, say, an implicit region, you know. X right. And I construct a hypergraph that approximates that region. So like, you know, here's a. Here's okay, a region. okay. So this there is a projection for that. And yes. Right. What, what, what uh, that problem? Let's, let's just let's just inter internalize this for one second. What what this actually is? So what Jonathan gave was a extrinsically specified, mm -hmm. you know, implicit equation here, and yeah. then effectively this is meshing that surface, right? Yeah. But it's with a hypergraph region. Yes. Um, and, and, and to answer Rob's question, yes, this is a this is a probabilistic procedure. And but the thing you get out doesn't necessarily have dimension two here. Right, right. Um, so can you I, measure its dimension? So uh, why? But why would you? Why would that be right? What do you mean by right? What do you mean? I mean it has roughly dimension. Two. It has dimension two. Period. Is there roughly. any analog <laughs> between your de dimension measures and something like Hausdorff dimension? Or yes, are they completely different. No, no. I mean, our standard notion of dimension is the is the hyper is the graph theoretic analog of Hausdorff dimension. Okay, perfect. Um, hang on, this is something is is failing on my machine. Let me see if I can. I might need to restart my kernel. <laughs> um, but what I was going to show was so the, the the thing I was going to illustrate was that that um, that parameter one point two in that function is telling you effectively the discretization cutoff. That 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 one point two is telling you at what you know at what distance scale do we consider points to be adjacent. And so obviously if, if we mm -hmm. if we load that, uh, it's you kind of like a a max cell measure, like uh, how many elements you want. Right. Exactly. Something, and some, how many cells you want. Yeah. Right. So, so if I lowered that, I would have this, I would still have the same number of vertices, but they would be connected more sparsely. It would, I would get a more sparsely connected graph. Um, actually, hang on. Wait, it's, it, my kernel is now working again, so I might be able to show that. So if I say... This, is, this should just output the spatial graph without any, without any coordinatization information. But if I lowered that to like... Uh, one, it should start to get, become sparse and become, become more sparse. And the, the representation of the graph that you're showing here is uh, what, what, um, uh, what's, is this the standard uh, um, spring model or no? Doesn't look yeah, like no, I mean, it. This is just, yeah, this is a, I think it, it uses spring electrical embedding by default. Um, Looks a bit dense for that, but yes, okay, fine. Well, it is a, it's a, it's a graph whose density, whose effective density varies quite a bit. But it, but it looks, it looks a bit. Oh, why don't we, why don't we do, do it? It doesn't uh, matter. It's not important. No, 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 no. Do, do a, do a different embedding. Uh, okay, sure. Let me, let me do the, let me do the higher density version. Uh, Part of the problem is that I'm doing this in a fairly large notebook. Um, but uh, okay, what 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 embedding would you like? Um, I don't know, uh, some kind of layered digraph embedding, just for fun. Even though it's not a digraph. Well, layered embedding, layered embedding. Oh, useless. Well, with an aspect ratio, <laughs> aspect ratio arrow, whatever. Oh. Yeah. I mean, useless, but it does show you it's it is just a graph, right? I mean, would you have pegged that as being a, a hyperbolic space? <laughs> no, right, right. But um, but okay. So what this is showing is so can you can you measure the dimension here? Could could you could you um you've got uh, yeah. Let me let me actually you give me a moment. One let second. I, I will be right fire. back in just a second. One. 
moment. Again, um, hey, uh, I can I can give it a go. Let's let's see what happens. Uh, okay, if I do this, I can pick. Let me take some random vertex. And then I should be able to say that. And that failed. Let me figure out why. Wait, do I have to say, I might have to say dimension. I forget how this function works. Okay, so it's roughly 3.1 dimensional, apparently at that point. Where, where you expect it to be mostly two point something dimensional, if you average it over the, over the thing. Well, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of unclear what, what, what the correct answer, hang on, let, let, me, let me see. Let me see how characteristic that actually is. I may, I may be able to do. Okay, it, very, it, it seems to vary quite a lot. Let, let, me, let me try it with a slightly. Oh, not, sorry. Yeah. Let me do that with a high, slightly higher density. Okay, but this this gives some sense of roughly what's going on here. I mean, I'm a little bit suspicious that more should be studied about the you know dimension variation in these in these meshes. But I think the I mean the key. I think it's confusing that that vocabulary of dimension variation. Um, and well, but it's, it's real for physics. That's why we use it. I see. I mean, it's but, real. But it's like, yeah. But one can formulate a utility argument too. It's like, let's say that this scheme, you know, in what sense is it uh, useful? Because usually you don't, you, you, you use a, you model a PD with a PDE because there's something you want to answer about the underlying system. Yes. Right. And so how good, how well would this uh, method be able to answer those kinds of, you know, underlying analysis questions. Well, right. But I mean, that, look, the fact is, it's not self-evident that numerical analysis will work at all. Right? You, you, have, you have the Navier-Stokes equations or whatever equations you want. And you mm -hmm. say, I'm not really going to solve these continuous equations. I'm going to solve these equations that... Um, but that's you know, a pretty good argument. So when that's... So, so that's kind of what you started on a little while ago, saying that that, 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 that continuum model runs out of steam, basically. It's no longer, it's not valid, basically. Yeah, you know, eventually it's, it's not valid in the physical world, but that's a different issue. I mean, the, the question of whether, look, years ago when I worked on cellular automaton fluids, here was mm -hmm. the idea there, remind you of the idea. Okay, so the idea is you could have accurate molecular dynamics or you could have incredibly approximate molecular dynamics where you just have a cellular automaton with ones and zeros, so to speak, rather than actual molecules with velocities and all this kind of thing, right? But the point was that on a large scale, what you get from just having little ones and zeros on a grid was equivalent to what you got by having real molecules and scaling that up. And both were equivalent to the PDEs. Right? And, and then the third approach would have been take the PDEs and do numerical analysis and grind down to meshes and things like this. But then what you need to understand as a user of that is at what scale, which one method is. is sort of Absolutely. Pressing. Right. And there's a whole, look, there's a whole giant literature tree that grew from that cellular automaton fluid stuff of mine. It's now lattice Boltzmann methods seem to be the main buzzword used there. Um, and it's basically, you know, there are places where that works well. There are places where traditional Navier-Stokes works well. 
and it's it's all you know it's been engineering you know like like for example i i don't i have so the classical the, the, the two the classical cases are obviously fluid you know high reynolds number of fluid dynamics or something yes but, and, and so and now case, you're finding einstein equation a similar well, Yes, but, but remember, it's not really the same thing because the the cellular automaton fluids thing was a is, is approximating molecular dynamics with discrete elements, so to speak. This is yes. saying we can actually approximate space time with discrete elements. But by the way, in that case, it's real. The discrete elements are really there. Whereas in the cellular automaton fluids case, they were just idealized discrete elements. It was not a realistic model of actual molecules. So, but I mean, the, the, the other, I mean, the other, well, let's see, the, the, uh, I did want to point out, by the way, that, 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 that's a pretty large dimension fluctuation there. So it, it, it's, uh, I don't yeah, think these, that's, that's large enough. but, but I've got a, so, so Stephen, do you think these methods might, you know, cause numerical methods break down if you say, try to study turbulence. I mean, yeah, maybe there's a chance these would, that'd be really interesting. Well, look, th this is okay. Let me let me just tell you a, a little tale from the past. Okay, mm -hmm. so my original reason for invent okay, what was my reason for inventing the whole cellular automaton fluids business? The whole idea was all right. I can share something here. Let me share some random thing. I'll share something. I remember a guy coming from this uh, connection machine company at Stanford and showing off that stunning, uh, you know, a chemical reaction or something. Yeah, right. No, that was that was that was. I mean, originally. I invented this because I was doing some consulting work for, for Thinking Machines Corporation, and they have this giant, massively parallel computer, and they were competing with people who were running Fortran programs for doing you know, numerical finite difference type stuff. And they were just totally losing like crazy. And I realized that with their machine, which had no floating point units and just bitwise operations, you could do cellular automata very efficiently. And I had thought about doing cellular automata for fluid mechanics, and that's what gave the push to do that. And unfortunately, they, they messed it up, but that's a different different story altogether. But I mean, if, if we look at, um, oh, let's see, from the very distant past, if I can pull this up. Um, uh, well, let's see, I've got two things here. Let me just see. Um, I think I remember this doing, showing off a, like an etching process in semiconductor manufacturing. Okay, that, that yeah, sounds plausible. I mean, let's see. This is from the infinitely ancient past. And let me just pull up another, and just to remind oneself what the heck was going on here. Um, the um okay yeah actually this is a good diagram so you know this is the idea for fluid mechanics that you have these discrete particles bouncing around and when you look at and they have these discrete rules and when you look at it on a large scale and you coarse grain it effectively you get something which is like fluid mechanics, right? And you can show with certain, you know, assumptions that, by the way, I mean, the derivation of fluid mechanics from molecular dynamics has never been rigorous, ever. It's never been rigorously, you know, that, that is something that requires certain assumptions about molecular chaos and so on that are not provable because I now sort of understand why they're not provable and it's really hard and they, they, they throw you right in the face of computational irreducibility and undecidability and so on. But the you know one can to a good approximation one can assume that certain things are random and can be replaced by statistical averages. Okay, so now Rob was asking about turbulence. So the original reason I studied this was because in ordinary fluid dynamics you've got a continuous equation. You don't really know what the equation does, and you try and do numerical analysis, and you have no idea whether the numerical analysis is correctly giving you a representation of what the equation does. The whole point here is. Whatever it does, you know what it does because it's just a bunch of bits. There's no, oh, I didn't approximate that correctly. There is a definite model and it's just based on bits flapping around, okay? And so, you know, I did this and I got up to Reynolds numbers of uh, between 50 and 100 for flow past plates and stuff like this back in the mid 80s. And then I was talking to lots of fluid dynamics people and I was saying, can you 
you know, show me what you get in some other cases, because that's the that's the place where there's transition to turbulence and in, in you know these basic forms of flow, you get this vortex street and the vortex street starts becoming irregular and so on. And the following thing repeated itself. I think I think probably there's a bunch of I was at Princeton in those days and people like Steve Orzag were the the main um sort of uh uh, and um, uh, the variety of fluid dynamics people there. But in any case, the, the repeated story was, well, of course our codes can do that. I said, okay, show me a picture. And, you know, I've, I've actually got experimental data, I've, you know, from people, you know, show me a picture of it. And they'd say, oh, it's easy, you know, I'll just get a graduate student to do it, you know, just come back next week and it will be done. So I would do that next week. Excuse of some kind. Come back again excuse of some kind. And in the end, I never got results from their codes, never. And so eventually I realized, I said, the reason you're not doing this is because you have no idea when your code does some random thing, you have no idea whether that's a correct result or whether it's some glitch in your numerical scheme. And they were like, well, uh, yes, uh, that is a problem. So maybe Rob, you probably, I mean, you know much more of the history of this. I mean, you know, this this problem of actually reproducing turbulent flow is, I don't know whether anybody's, you know, whether anybody would stand up and say, I've got it. You know, this really reproduces the Navier-Stokes equations. May I share? Now. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, So this is a Navier-Stokes equation. Equation we're not, around. We're not seeing anything, Oliver. Oh well. Let me I try again. Sharing at the wrong screen or something. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. So here we have. So on the left hand side we have an inflow, and this is a, a cylinder, and then we get uh, like the lovely, the Kalman uh, vortex street from that. Yep. So, that's that's the thing you're talking about, I guess. Absolutely, yeah. I would yeah. show the velocity field. What what are you showing there? Are you showing the, the velocity field? field? Yeah, yeah. It's the. But um, you're not showing the vector. You're not showing the vector. No, 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 no. This is just the. Um, let me see. The velocity. The velocity. Yeah, the x velocity field is this. Yeah, in the x okay. direction. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. So this is yep. this is found by running. Well, I want to see that some more. I mean, this okay. is. Okay. <laughs> just a second. <laughs> so, uh, sorry. Uh, okay. There you go. <laughs> How certain are you that this is right? So, for example, in this case, if you look at, the, I don't know, the Struhol number or something like that as a function of Reynolds number, or you look back in the, in the far back in the wake, right, you will see close to the cylinder, at, let's say Reynolds number of 50, you should see something periodic. And then progressively, the vortices start having interactions. You go further down in the wake and they start getting to be not periodic. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I measured that in detail here, do you think it would agree with experiments or do you think it would have all kinds of weird glitches from numerical scheme? Uh, well, I would hope it would match um, to, to experiments. Yes, sure. What would you measure? I think there's a couple of things here, Stephen. Is this, and you may see from that picture that this problem is somewhat down. You mean you mean there's viscosity, which is having there's an effect. Viscosity, yeah, in yes. here. Um, right, but the, the, you see, the problem is, this is where things start getting hocus pocusy, right? Because mm -hmm. if if you say, I say you're going to reproduce this experiment, you're going to say, look, every time you run the experiment, you'll get a different answer. So how can you expect me to reproduce the experiment, right? Because in detail, the you know the motion of the vortices when you get into the turbulent regime gets to be kind of random. And it's like, well, I can run the experiment once, I can run it another time, I can run it another time, or I can get something that statistically agrees here. That's, I think, what you would expect to say. Am I right? Well, I mean, this, uh, the, the vortices are going to depend on the initial conditions on how you set those up. So, yep. Uh, right. But, but you see, okay, so th this is where things start getting very funky. It's like, can you explain, okay, if you see randomness, in your system, where did the randomness come from? Right? So you may say, okay, so how would you answer that question? So first of all, do you see, if I, if I pump up the Reynolds number here, will I start seeing more random, a more random weight? No, the system, you, you can't pump it up indefinitely. It's, it's going to break down at some point. What will I it think do? It, what will it do when it breaks down? 
What will it look um, like when it breaks down? It's just going to give a garbage solution. It doesn't, I, I doesn't understand. Work. That's it's exactly what Steve Ozak would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back yeah. in 1983 or whenever that was. Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, the, the point is that you need to know in which regime, flow regime, you can apply the equation. That's part I of the know, equation. I know. I <laughs> know. You you are. It's really funny. I mean, you you are repeating the exact same things that I was told. But but, it, but that's. I think it's okay. I mean, this is uh, as long as the as the the um, the surrounding that you're 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 trying to model is is in that in that regime. That's fine. If if it's not, no, that, that's right, Oliver. From an engineering point of view, you're completely <laughs> correct. Okay, the Thank physics you. question <laughs> that is is has been of interest for for like uh, yeah, sure. 100 years is when there is randomness and turbulent flow, where does the randomness come from, right? So the answer could be, oh, it's an amplification of thermal noise in the fluid. That's one possible answer. Yeah. Another answer could be, it's like the digits of pi. The intrinsic computation of the dynamics of the system generates that randomness, Okay. I think the second one is more likely to be correct. The first one would suggest that, you know, people's attempt to prove existence and uniqueness of Navier-Stokes is going to fail because in the end, Navier-Stokes isn't enough. It's excavating details of the, of the molecular dynamics, yeah. right? So th those are the two choices. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by the time you get to hypersonic flow and things like that, you know you're excavating the molecular dynamics. So that's not really on the table. But the question is, in everyday turbulence, right, at low, you know, low Mach number, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are you excavating molecular dynamics or not? And that's the thing that would be really interesting to answer. And it's kind of, a, it's kind of outrageous to me that that still hasn't been answered. Um, even though, uh, you know, actually, I'll tell you another bizarre thing. So my, my, you know, my expectation is that... It is not, it's more like digits of pi or rule 30 or whatever else. And one feature of that is it means that the randomness can be repeatable. You said, oh, it depends on the boundary conditions. What happens? Maybe that isn't true. Maybe you get the same apparently random sequence for a range of boundary conditions. In other words, viscosity damps out the you know, little changes of the initial conditions. And you, know, you then get the exact same result. So, of course, I've asked fluid dynamics experimentalists about this. And many, many years ago, uh, some people who did convection and liquid helium said, well, actually, yes, we have observed that. It goes on for hours. You get this kind of seemingly random sequence. But, but so I said, okay, where's the, where's the reference? He said, well, we never published that because we thought it couldn't possibly be right. So, you know, it's again, I don't know what's happened now, but, but that was the situation as of, as of, I don't know, 30 something years ago or something. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a, yes, I don't think these methods, I mean, I think the most interesting thing to my mind about these methods that Jonathan is, is working on are, is the fact that they can deal with variable geometry in a very, you know, in a way that seems more flexible. I mean, look, like the solid atomic and fluids business, and now last bolts. I mean, it reminds me, there's another thing which is very, sounds similar or related to what Jonathan is doing, like from, from fluid dynamics too, which came up in aerospace, which are these boundary layer methods yes. where, where you explicitly know there's going to be a lot of activity near the boundary surface of something. Yep. So, so you've sort of focused the method there. And it's basically you do the adaptive mesh refinement ahead of time because you know there's going to be the action. So you, you generate the mesh in such a way that it's going to capture the action well. Right. Yeah. right. right. It, it's mesh refinement, but not adaptive. Exactly. Yeah. It's pre, pre refined, so to speak. Yeah. What do we think that the, I mean, you know, like on an airplane. But, but it also leads to an asymptotic method, you know, as a way to computing things asymptotically. It's, Right, but it's a practical matter, like on a on a flying aeroplane, it's like an inch above the wings is the boundary layer, I think, right. of that order. Um, and um, I mean, what but is? But you guys would probably say that the dimension is higher there. <laughs> it's like, and we all look <laughs> confused and say, "What?" It's like, well, I know that how is much confused. above three, like yeah, 18 I know that, that, that's or 
that's confusing. I agree. And that's what, something we need to figure out. Because look, in the physical universe, okay, it is our expectation that the universe started infinite dimensional and gradually sort of cooled down to be three-dimensional. And one of the things that we suspect is that there may be dimension fluctuations in the universe that might be observable. Okay, and which is very different from standard Einstein gravity, which lives only in three plus one dimensions, and that's it. And there's no further discussion about dimension. And so, you know, that's a, a big, you know, implication of these models is that you can have dimension fluctuations. So, you know, that's one reason why it would be really good to understand this. And I, I think it's a little bit, you know, strange that Jonathan's numerical methods are giving such big dimension fluctuations. And Jonathan, maybe you can comment on that. I mean, do you know, uh, I mean, you know, the other possibility, which I remain open to, is that there's a way to reformulate general relativity in terms of, of fixed curvature changing dimension in space-time. I don't know whether that's, I mean, maybe Jose or Jonathan can comment on that, that idea. I mean, it's, you know, Jonathan, if you said in your curvature estimator, I'm sorry, your dimension estimator here, you say, I want to jointly estimate both curvature, both dimension and curvature, what would happen? Wouldn't you get very different results? Well, you, you can't do it. You, can't you, you do to, it in the aggregate? You have to fix one or the other. Are you sure that's right, even in the aggregate? I understand for a single GDC ball, there's, that's what you have to do. But what about if you look over a, you know, a whole collection of GDC balls at different points? Is there not different consistency conditions between the dimension and the curvature? But then, you are, like... then you are implicitly fixing one or the other just based on an averaging assumption. Okay. But so how should we think about... Okay, so hold on. Let, let me understand. If you're trying to compute curvature... Are you then, you say, let me assume it's three-dimensional, then let me work out the curvature. Is that what you have to do? That's, that's how all of our functions have worked, yeah. Okay, okay, fine. But so, Roger, so then, then the answer, I mean, the answer might be more bizarre than one thinks. It might be, okay, we think the universe is three-dimensional, but actually that's just something we assume. And given that it's three-dimensional, we believe that there's curvature in space-time. But we might also say, I don't believe in curvature. It's all flat, but its dimension varies. Do you think that's consistent, Jonathan? Do you think that there's a consistent way to formulate general relativity like that? Yeah, I mean, we've discussed this extensively, right? Yeah, but, but can we actually, I understand, but, but it would be, the question is, what would be the difference between such a formulation of general relativity and, and the ordinary one? You have a dimension tensor. Which we, which we can compute. I mean, we, there, was, there was a whole winter school project about that. Yeah, except that we don't fully understand how tensors work away from integer dimensions. I mean, we? We're beginning. Well, we're, as far as I'm concerned, we're beginning to. Maybe you are further down that path than I am. I mean, in... Um, I don't understand what that means, but all right. Well, no, no. So what... what What we talked about, yes, we talked about dimension tensors in terms of, I mean, the question is, what is a tensor index? Right. And I constructed this formulation of tensors as essentially functions over the Cartesian product of the vertex set with itself. And that gives you the standard notion of tensors in cases where you have, inter where you have integer dimensional spaces. Um, right. But so the, the concept for people's benefit here is, that a tensor index is just a, you know, like a geodesic defines kind of one tensor index in some sense. You're, you know, you're going off in some direction that's defined by geodesic and that's the tensor index associated with that direction. And if you have multiple tensor indices, you're picking multiple directions at a particular place. And so it could be the case that those directions, you know, sort of fit in a three-dimensional, you know, that, that, that you can have three orthogonal directions, or it might be the case that you can't have three orthogonal directions. It doesn't really matter. You can still define sort of tensor indices in terms of these, uh, you know, directions of going in the graph rather than 
uh, directions in a sort of pre-made space. At least that that's some, um, but but I mean, but for benefit. No, but 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 I understand how you arrive at what you arrive. Okay, so so you can always you can always embed, you know, even if you have a hypergraph, you can always embed it in an extrinsic space of some thick dimension. It's like this two n plus one dimensional space, right? Yes. Okay, but and but but I think that one can talk about that, or but but what you can always derive something that's that's useful like engineering values like i really want to know what that density is that you call um, dimension do you know what i'm saying there's probably something that this why do we solve the pd well we want to find out the fluid velocity or the the temperature or the do you know what i'm saying but isn't that what you guys get out of this this density or the the dimension that you call it i'm i'm concerned about this you know equivalence between density and dimension it doesn't uh, that's not quite and and i'm also what what, what what equivalence i mean there isn't an equivalence no no yeah. i didn't think it was equivalence but there's something that you guys get out of that concentration well, I, as, as I was saying earlier, it's much more akin to a Schlieren than to a density, right? To, to a what? To a, to a Schlieren. It, it, it's, it's a density gradient, not a density. I see. Okay. Sure. No, but, but, but that means that it can still be useful to someone. What I'm saying sure. is that the, the output of this can be useful. One would hope so. I mean, yeah, people, people compute Schlierens in, in engineering and fluid mechanics and things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but okay, but 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 the thing that I'm still okay, just zooming out for a second. There's a couple of different points. In what sense, Jonathan, you were measuring that shock effectively and saying its dimension is larger than two, but don't you need to fix the? Okay, you're saying assume its curvature is zero. Is that correct? Then its effective dimension was two point eight or whatever. Is that right? You're not assuming the curvature is zero. You're assuming that the you, you, look. The, the the point is, I mean, this is we discussed this in in several places before. That that you you have a variety of different scales involved, right? You have a characteristic curvature scale, and you have a characteristic dimension scale. And the characteristic dimension scale is is generally assumed to be much larger than the characteristic curvature scale. Um, so, if you so all, all that matters is that the that the volume elements you're considering when you compute the dimension are smaller than the characteristic scale across which curvature is taken to vary. And as long as that occurs, then you have no problem. So yeah, I think you said that the opposite way around first time. So you're saying the dimension scale is smaller than the curvature scale. Curvature is slowly varying relative to... You're saying that the scale over which you can measure the growth rate of geodesic balls is and see their dimension is small compared to the... Uh, uh, distances of which curvature is being measured. Yeah, but but the dimension scale is larger in the sense that dimension is generally in in the in the relativistic formulation at least that I've been using is assumed to vary more gradually than curvature. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Because what? Because I mean, the only difference is as you as we've discussed, it's one is an exponential, one's a quadratic, right? That's the only real distinction. Right. But but for purposes, okay, let's zoom out for a second, and we should wrap up soon. But I mean, uh, the Okay. First point is these methods are basically a a form of what one could call, you know, hypergraph meshing or something. Except they're not meshing because there's no mesh as such. It's I don't know what the right term for it is, but it is something where you have not where you're subdividing, but you have not constrained the geometry of the subdivision. You're merely subdividing based on connectivity not geometry or even topology. And then the mapping back to physical space is something approximate, just as the mapping to values of dependent parameters is something approximate in any standard PDE method. That is, if you want to know what is the value of the scalar field at exactly this point, it's like, oops, we don't know that because there wasn't a finite element right there or we have to interpolate this thing to get that value. 
So similarly, what's being said here is that to do the same thing, you have to do that even to determine what the spatial coordinate of something is supposed to be. Do you think that's a, Jonathan, do you think that's a correct characterization? Right, again, that, that's part of it, yeah. What's, what's the part that I'm missing there? I mean, it, to contrast this with traditional PDE schemes, what's another part that I'm missing? Well, so in a traditional, like a finite volume PDE scheme with AMR, uh, the mesh refinement tracks a scalar parameter, but only ever approximately, right? Because you're only ever refining, like, you know, uh, the particular numerical relativity code that I work with refines on average, usually every 50 or 100 iterations or something. Okay. So the grid topology roughly matches that of the solution domain, but it's no, the, no one claims there's an exact correspondence. The key difference from my perspective between what we're doing and what those kinds of methods are, are doing is that this, in, in our case, the, the correspondence is exact because the two quantities, are, you know, the, the, the two objects are mutually computable from each other. I can always compute the scalar field right. value from the, from the hypergraph topology or vice versa. Right. Okay. But, but, so what you're saying, let, let's zoom out for a second because I think they're two independent things. First thing is the observation that you could just do plain standard PDE technology, but not you know, but with a graph-based mesh rather than a geometrically defined mesh, first point. Second point, the actual structure of the graph could give you the values of dependent parameters, which is not the case in the usual setup. In the usual setup, you're painting things on the mesh to determine values. Well, no, it Whereas is the, case the usual setup, just, just less exactly. That's my whole point. Well, you're saying, you're saying because the adaptivity tracks certain parameters of the i mean but but that's only the case if it's tracking if the thing you're measuring is this gradient i mean you could be painting something completely different i mean some things that oliver has in his framework will not be things that will cause you to have adaptivity it's only it's well, presumably any gradient will allow will cause you to have adaptivity yeah I mean, any, any scalar field you can compute gradients of no i understand but the but the thing that you are then that the refinement of the mesh is reflecting is the gradient of the scalar field, not the value of the scalar field. It just so happens that the Einstein equations that the thing you're interested in is curvature, which is effectively one of those gradient-like things. Right. But the whole point of the geodesic ball construction is that you're computing an integral. So you're, you're reconstructing the scalar field from the gradient. And Indeed, indeed, indeed. But I'm... It doesn't make any difference. I see what you're saying. Okay, so what you're saying is, okay, let's just walk through this logic again, because this wasn't, the, the logic is normally you have dependent variable values and you have a, a shadow of those dependent va variable values in the, mesh, in, the, in the subdivisions that you're making. And what we're saying is actually you can take the, the values literally defined by that subdivision, that, that, that meshing, and you don't even need to worry about having that sort of painting separate dependent variables in your system. Is it, I mean, for PDE folk, is it kind of self-evident that the meshing will be a reflection of the actual solution to the PDE? Is that something that's sort of a standard standard point of view or is that something because i mean i'd always thought of it i hadn't really internalized that point i'd always thought of the um that, that, that's that's what amr is okay i don't know what amr even stands for Depth and mesh refinement okay yeah I, I understand i understand that's the idea i i had not so, so like like it you know, it, like that in the finite element mesh that that um oliver showed earlier uh we could you, you could reconstruct an approximation to the density field I, I, I realize that now. I'm just, I, I guess I hadn't really, I had thought of it as, uh, you know, I mean, like, like, for instance, you could say, you know, if I say plot points or something, you know, if, if I'm doing, you know, okay, so the, the analogous thing in a different setting would be something like this. I could say, I mean, it isn't, well, okay, if, if I do something like, um, uh, Okay, if I do this, you're saying 
that in a first approximation, I can reconstruct, you know, I could reconstruct, I, I'd never really thought about doing this, it's kind of silly, but I perhaps should have done, that I can reconstruct that curve from just looking at the density of these points. Right. Or the, yeah, or, or the integral of the density, yeah. Right. Hmm. I mean, is that, I, I'm sorry, for numerical analyst folk here, is that like a standard obvious, totally everybody understands that point, point of view or not? No, I don't think so. I think the the standard point is basic. is is much is much more basic. You um, just, uh, I mean, be, be, we think much more geometrically about the problem than you folks do. So we'll just see the geometry, and we 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 understand where the refinement is needed, but we never go the backwards way, so to speak. So we yeah. never re reconstruct uh, in the way backwards. Okay, fine. All right, I don't feel so bad because I'd never really. No, it's okay. I think. The, um, I mean, okay, but, but so so. Yeah. There are, what's that, Rob? Well, no, I, th I think you. I mean, I think you could you could reconstruct that, but it's but, but as Oliver says, it's sort of not not the way we usually think. I mean. Yeah. Right. Okay. So there are two ideas here. One is that you know the mesh doesn't the mesh is just a graph, and the other is that you can reconstruct values from the structure of the mesh. So in other words, the mesh is the whole story and we're both reconstructing the mapping to space and we're reconstructing the independent variables effectively and we're reconstructing the dependent variables, both things. So, so here's, a, here's a naive question. How can you get both, how can you independently get both the dependent and independent variables from the structure of the mesh. Why is it obvious that you can do that? That's a question for Jonathan. And well, in general, you can't. This. And I think that's what we, we, we're batting around with this question about whether you can measure dimension and curvature separately. Right, right. So, so, so in, the, in the pure hypergraph substitution case, we reconstruct the dependent variables. We make no attempt to reconstruct the independent ones. What would you consider to be the independent variables there? Well, the, sp the spatial coordinates with respect to some gauge. That's true. We haven't been concerned with that. I mean, we, we could, you know, we are at first reconstructing curvatures and things like that. Right, right. So, so, so we, you know, we're just using pure hypergraph embedding without any concern about what the actual spatial coordinates are. I see. Your point is when you draw a picture, the fact that that might correspond to physical space in its, you know, ruler measured coordinates is amusing, but not necessary. Right, right. I mean, yeah, it, it, we, we, the way it's currently set up, we cannot reconstruct. We can reconstruct the independent, if we make assumptions about the dependent variables, we can make, we can reconstruct the independent ones and vice versa. But right now, in, at least in the way I've configured things, there's no way of doing both reconstructions simultaneously. Fair enough. Okay, but, but then as a practical matter, in so okay so look in terms of what to actually do here so jonathan i mean your your code takes what does it take in and what does it give out so right now it takes in um okay so, so it's, it's a little bit complicated again because of the einstein equation stuff we have to specify a gauge so i the, the, for the i think we're agreeing that let's not do einstein equations i mean no. right, right. okay so so, so in, the, in the euler equation case uh, all it's doing is it's taking in a specification of an initial Cauchy surface. So it, it, it takes in one of those, uh, you know, curved manifold to graph outputs that you get from, from that function repository function. Yep. And, and you, you, you specify, so that, that completely determines the, you know, the, the Cauchy data. And then you just give it, a, a, you know, a, a, a final time and it gives you um, a sequence of, you know, intermediate hypersurface, inter intermediate Cauchy surfaces. Um, so that is something that could probably be plugged into Oliver's framework. Right. I mean, so, so one of the points that Rob, well, actually both Rob and Oliver made before, uh, before this live stream started was that that's at least one fundamental problem with that is ordinarily, you know, AndySolve does not return intermediate meshes. And if it has to return every intermediate mesh, which it would basically have to do for this method, you're going to end up having like, you know, five gigabyte uh, return values and things. It's, it's going to be- Why does it have to return every intermediate mesh? 
Well, because because if you want an interpolating function, right, the, 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 the standard output, as Rob pointed out, the standard output from ND-solve is an interpolating function. So you should be able to, you, should, you, you want to be able to interpolate the value at any intermediate time step, uh, any intermediate time value, which means you, know, you need to know the mesh topology at every intermediate time value. Ugh. Well, okay. But I mean, why aren't we just doing reconstruction to the point where we can just we just say let's approximate this by an interpolating function at every point why can't we do that it's not a, a lossless thing to do but i mean i don't see how you output, do that Stephen. if you either know the dependent variables or the independent variables but not both how could you do that Yeah, well, I think it isn't quite the same workflow as ND solve then. Yeah, I think it's a bit different. I mean, I, some things are similar, like, you know, so say instead of, a, you know, an Oliver's framework, you give it a mesh or a spatial region. Here you might give it a hypergraph. Um, and then you have the PDE, but it, but it is a bit different. I mean, what and, and how, you, how you interrogate things, I mean, how you get information out of it is completely different. So, so maybe... Right, well but one question is we haven't really studied interpolating functions for hypergraphs. You know, an interpolating function for a, you know, a, nu a numerical value, we kind of understand how that works. And yeah. you can get away with not specifying numerical value, you know, an incredibly finely granular thing, because you can just say, you know, pick these derivatives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But for hypergraphs, we have no idea how that works, I think, although maybe we do through causal graphs and other such things. Jonathan, do you have any brilliant ideas here? So in other words, if you're trying to store the data structure of hypergraph through time, mm -hmm. I don't think you, uh, you, you can store just the events. It's a much smaller right. amount of data. No, no, that, that, that's, that's certainly true. Although um, I'm not sure, you know, ultimately we, we're, we're gonna have to, unlike with the interpolating function case, I think ultimately we are gonna have to enforce some kind of discrete time step constraint. Right. I, I don't think we can do hypergraph interpolation for, for real numbers. No, I'm sure we can't. But I mean, we, but we don't even care about that because in the end, all we have is a bunch of events. I mean, that's right. what's going to happen in any of these settings. And, and even in the numerical analysis case, it just so happens that those events are organized. I mean, I, I suspect, okay, question. When you do modern numerical analysis on a massively parallel, you know, on some fancy parallel processor, and you have an integration domain, what do you do for the, I mean, how do you, how do you synchronize the effects and the different parts of the integration domain? So, you know, those are, those are typically done as you, 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 you subdivide the inter integration domain in some clever way that, and, and then you, you go and integrate on each piece and then you have stages where you, you try and try and overlap the results somehow. Yeah. Actually, a graph, a partition, a graph partition is trying is, is a function that finds such such a good partition, actually. What do you mean by so in other words, given a mesh? So if I what you're telling me is if I take what's a good way to make a random mesh of something? If I say discretize, what do I want to say? I want to say discretize region. What do, what do I do here? If I if I want to make a let's say I have a picture of a, you what do would a you disk. Do? I mean that's that's simple. Well, that's not very exciting. How do I show the mesh here? How do I show uh, the mesh? Just the simplest is to use the attached cell down there. Uh, oh, well, that's... It's a boundary discretized mesh. Also, how do I get the interior of the disk? But that shouldn't be... Um, discretize reach. I don't know why it does it. Discretize reach. Well, because it's it's making a single polygon out of the whole disk. Yeah. Okay. All right. So there we've got a there we've got the discretized region. What was your point now? Right. So suppose you had suppose you had four processors. You'd want to somehow subdivide that 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 entire mesh into four subsections, which had minimal you know, minimal overlap. Yeah, I see. So I would take out the graph here. I see. 
you have to snip it. So you want to find a way to snip it into four pieces that has roughly equal size and minimal crossings. Interesting. Minimal. Because that's relevant. Gosh, we, a completely different... And the, func and the function that we have that does that is graph partition. You know Find what? communities does it uh, you know, but where you don't say how many you want. How do I get out the graph from this? Can I quickly share? Yeah. But by the way, that graph partition thing is what we should be thinking about for parallelization of our hypergraph updating. So mm -hmm. I have a function that does domain decompositioning uh, of, of domains and solves PDEs over them. So what you see here is a uh, like a, a manga mesh. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the, the darker lines here, those are lines where, where they're, the lighter ones are overlapping. So these are solved. So th this blue one, for example, is solved on one CPU. Um, this light brown one is solved in another CPU. And this is the, the inter-process communication area between the, the different yeah, I get subsets. It. Yeah, that's how it works. You know what? We should be doing this. Jonathan, this is a, well, this is more a comment from Max. We should be doing this for, the, um, uh, for our... Uh, you know, to be able to do hypergraph evolution on parallel processors. I mean, that's how we should think about it. I don't think the domain decomposition, as in that case, it is not, you know, the seams still have a lot in them, right? The seams are one dimension lower, but they still have a lot in them. Yes. The, okay, but in any case, what, what we're saying here is we can think about the updating as there are a bunch of updating events and this question of how you store the time series. Find graph partition is the name. Okay. Right, but you're already kind of, you're already jumping a level. I mean, this is why I was saying earlier that your, your description is, is, was correct, but not complete of, of what's going on here, right? Because you're, you're jumping now to the situation where we actually know what the graph evolution rule is, which we don't a priori, right? Right yeah. now we we just have a PDE, we have a mesh. Um, there's another step, which is then finding a, um, you know, essentially a, a hypergraph evolution rule that reproduces the, uh, you know, the hypergraph mesh refinement that you would have got if you solved the continuum PDE system. Okay. So yes, this is a ca classic problem, right? So for cellular automata, people have asked me for years, okay, you've got one that does the Navier-Stokes equations. How about the one for my favorite PDE? Right? And I've always had to say, we don't really have a way to do that. We have a way to do it for the Navier-Stokes equations. It's natural. Similarly, we have a way to do it for the Einstein equations. It's natural. But if you say, can you do it for some, you know, well, for example, a, a, a case that I would imagine is stress equations. Right, because right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, as, I, as we've discussed earlier, and, and as was the basis for this Euler equation stuff, Anything where you have an act where you can derive the um, you can derive the continuum hyperbolic equations from an action principle, uh, we have a systematic procedure for for reconstructing what the um, you know what the evolution rules are. How? Because, well, because we have a way of doing it for the Einstein-Hilbert action, and with the Einstein-Hilbert action, you've got the you know you've just got the Ricci scalar underneath the action integral, but our Ricci scalar is reconstructed from volume element expansions that we just do in the, in from the hypergraph topology. So if instead of interpreting that as a Ricci scalar, we interpret it as some other scalar quantity, it gives us a way of, you know, essentially defining an action integral for an arbitrary scalar quantity, and then and then finding rules that, you know, that that minimize that that, that extremize that, that 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 action integral. Okay, so the claim is, you can imitate anything by defining the Ricci value of the Ricci scalar. Not, not anything, a anything that can be defined in terms of an action. So, you know, we, we can do hydrodynamics, we can do solid mechanics, we can do electrodynamics because those are all based on action principles. But, you know, that, 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 there, there What's is What's the intrinsic reason why it needs an action principle? Is there something to do with the way that the events work? Is the action principle a statement about, I mean, in a sense, the density of events is the action. Is the fact that you say it needs to have an action principle? I, I don't quite know what you mean. I mean, the, the, the action the action principle emerges as a consequence of the fact that you know what it is that gives us the continuum dynamics is the statement that some quantity gets preserved as we as we let the hypergraph and the causal graph become infinitely large. 
for yes. the general relativistic case that gives it that's dimension and that you know that's what gives us the ricci scalar uh but if, but in some arbitrary pde system it's i mean it would also be dimension but the, but the point is we don't have to interpret the higher order corrections as being curvatures we can interpret them as being you know more general scalar fields so um, so would you typically be solving pdes that have some kind of you know conservation law then yes uh -huh. right i mean th th that's the other important thing right so the, the all of the um all the PDE systems that currently I've investigated have, uh, are, are either uh, conservative or, or quasi-conservative. Well, because okay. because when you take the large scale limit, something has to be survive in the large scale limit. Right, right. And there better be a conservation law. Or you're not going to get that. Mm -hmm. What what is the for the stress equations? What is the conservation law? What are the stress equations called? I don't even. It's embarrassing. I don't know. But what, what is the usual name for the stress strain equations with constitutive relations and all these kinds of things? I, I mean, are you talking about the nonlinear hyperelasticity equations? Or yes, yeah. Well, they're, they're called the nonlinear hyperelasticity equations. Okay, fair enough. That elasticity theory is the generic term. But what is conserved in that case? Well, the, the, the you're, you're you're treating components of the deformation gradient tensor as conserved quantities in in, in the conservation law formulation, I, 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 just as with density and momentum and, and internal energy, it's just I'm, like you're effectively taking the Euler equations and you're augmenting them with nine additional equations for the evolution of the deformation gradient, um, and that yeah, each one is treated as a conserved quantity, and the way that that's derived is as I say by taking some you extremize some action integral, you get the Euler-Lagrange equations, and then you take a partial Legendre transform to, to map them back into Eulerian coordinates, and you get the constraint equations for the for the deformation gradient. Fair enough. We should wrap up here. I, I gather I, I'm supposed to do some other live stream that's like completely different. And Jonathan, but... maybe just a, a final yeah. quick question. Do you have any idea of what the computational complexity is of your method? Uh, it's... The the actual scaling is quite favorable. I, I I haven't I haven't measured it, but but it's mm -hmm. it's it, um. I would assume it's it's polynomial, but with a with a fairly high degree would be my current estimation. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. Um. Boy, on our live stream, which I have not been looking at, there are a bunch of interesting comments and questions. I noticed one from Gregory Brown asking. Has anyone taken on the uh, VR interface building for physics project? Um, I believe there are some people working on that and that's uh, and Max Piskanoff's GitHub repository is the place to look for that. Um, maybe somebody can put the URL. I think you can find it from the front page of the physics project website. Um, and uh, ah, Roger is is, oh, Roger is giving what the this should be. Oh, that's useful. Okay, so this is. Oh, that's cool. That's really nice. Hmm. Hmm. So, to what extent could I like solve the Kelvin problem by doing graph partitioning on the on a discretized? I mean, if, if I do this discretization for a sphere or ball. And then I say, let's see, if I do highlight graph for that. What happens? Why, why can't I? Um, does, do I have to say graph plot 3D or something? It's only 2,000 vertices. Oh, I see. So there. So I've got certain regions on the sphere, right? Roger, is that right? I mean, they, they, they look like they have different colors. I can't quite yeah, see. Yeah, they them. do, they do, they do. Okay. They do. And if I say, um, if I do this, let me, let me do this again. So let's say I do like, um, let's say I say 10 here, for example. And then I say, um, graph plot 3D, and then I say edge style arrow transparent what well, can i say none for edge style yeah then i should get just 
just a bunch of oh what happened well shit um, that's not that seems like edge style doesn't um yeah i should at least be able to have transparent edges oh that is very very confusing and doesn't look like I see regions of color. Why, why am I not seeing that? I'm mean, seeing some regions. And in fact, here, if I say vertex style, vertex size arrow, let's say 0.3. So then I'll get a bunch of, of um, ag. Why doesn't that work? Should that not work? Why doesn't that work? Why can't I say what the vertex size is? No, why can't I say what the vertex size is there? Roger. Um, I don't know right away. Okay. All right, Check. fine. Okay. Well, anyway. Um, but, I mean, I think this question about how do you store an interpolated hypergraph, I, I bet there's a way to do this cleverly using events. Um, and, uh, and the analog of continuity, I mean, there is a direct analog of continuity that has to do with um, finite density of events is some kind of statement about continuity, I think. Anyway. Um, well, okay, interesting stuff, guys. Uh, and um, yep, to 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 be continued. And maybe um, I uh, hopefully now that we've introduced various people here, um, uh, can explore this further. And it would be cool to get at least some sense of what the design of a you know gravitational physics uh, modeling environment would look like. And we didn't talk about that in more detail, I think, here. But we did at least start on that. All right. We should wrap up here. Thanks very much, everybody. And um, thanks to folks on the live stream for interesting comments. We have another live stream about, I, I'm going to tell you what the topic is, because I don't even know the topic. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's sound and vision. Sound vision. And you're in it, Roger. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, see you in a moment, then.